all right over the weekend um, if you need additional help call cool down uh, they can help with uh, energy bills electric bills uh, and if you have someone who's over 65 or disabled they can help with air conditioners so uh, just important to uh, continue to check on people especially through the weekend um, so that they don't overheat so first up today to talk about COVID so I think you all know that um, the numbers have continued to rise in terms of number of cases for COVID. Yesterday in the city of St. Louis, we had 98 new cases reported. Um, and I'll talk a little about what those cases look like in a minute, but let me just say that for hospitalizations, we got a little bit of good news yesterday. Uh, hospitalizations were down in the region this is regional to 235 people hospitalized 51 in ICU 31 on ventilators and 40 people were uh, admitted to the hospital two days ago the average for the last seven days in terms of the number of people ad newly admitted to the hospital is 38 and as I think all of you, if you're a regular watcher, know that uh, those, those cases are, uh, are continuing to climb. Now, the other thing that we know, I have a couple of new numbers here for you today, is that the increase in the number of cases is primarily in young people. And when I say young people, I mean under 40. If we look at, the health department just ran these numbers for me today, uh, the last 30 days, the number of cases, 64% of those cases were under age 40. So that 11% of the cases were in their 50s, 6.5% in their 60s, 4% in their 70s, and a couple percent above that. So. Uh, that is a, a, a very high percentage of cases that uh, we are finding in the testing that are among young people. And so the cases are frankly rising faster. The number of cases are rising at a faster rate than the number of people going into hospitals. That's maybe for a couple of reasons. One, young people aren't, do not generally have the underlying health conditions that older people have and therefore may uh, not be hospitalized. Uh, and then uh, secondly, those, the, the young people who are getting those, uh, those positive results are, um, are just in better health. So 64% of the new cases over the last 30 days are on people under 40. So, um, we know that we only have uh, really a couple of levers in terms of what we can do to slow the spread and to slow people getting ill. And of course, hand washing, you know that, social distancing, wearing your mask. <clears throat> wearing the mask is the biggest, um, really the biggest preventative thing that you can do. We know that St. Louis City and St. Louis County about three weeks ago put in place mandatory mask wearing if you're inside and if you're outside and you uh, think that you may be within six feet of someone else but the other thing that we know is that surrounding counties the state of missouri does not have a mask mandate and we have a very fluid society we go across city county lines there's a lot of mixed messaging with regard to mask wearing but uh, the strongest thing that I can say is that everybody needs to, to be wearing a mask anytime they're within six feet of someone else, indoors or outdoors for that matter. The other thing on this mask wearing is that, I'm going to put this on for a second, okay. I try to take it off to talk to you because uh, it's, it's hard to understand someone when they when they are wearing a mask, but the only way to wear a mask correctly is covering your nose. And um, as someone said the other day, they said, we didn't ask you to wear a chin strap like that. We asked you to wear a, a face covering, covering your nose. And from what I'm reading recently, um, 
your nose is seeds, I'll use that word, uh, seeds the virus to your lungs even faster than in through your mouth. So when you are wearing your mask, and I know most of you are, thank you for that. Please make sure that your mask is covering your nose as well. Uh, everybody should be wearing a mask. That includes city employees. We've gotten a lot of questions about that. Um, yes, if you are, uh, everybody should be wearing a mask. If you're outdoors, you should wear it also if you're going to be within six feet of, of uh, someone else who's not in your immediate family, of course. Um, consider when you're dining out, consider taking that outdoor dining option. Uh, we know that being outdoors is um, better ventilation, a little less transmission, it's believed, outdoors than indoors. So if you can, you're dining outdoors. We know that you can't wear a mask while you're physically eating. Everybody understands that. Uh, but hopefully you're with a, a close group of people, your own family. Wear your mask unless you are eating and choose that outdoor dining option if it's at all possible. Limit your gathering sizes. You know, we, we believe that we are seeing spread that really just comes from, um, you know, social gatherings, birthday parties, graduation parties, barbecues, just, just sort of what we would have previously considered to be normal social gatherings, but limit the size of those gatherings, please. Um, so important because the only other thing that we can do is pull back on opening. We're really trying not to do that. As you all know, we did pause on the opening, uh, increasing the size of, that large venues can, can open. We did that a week ago. I guess it was a week ago today. Um, everyone's struggling with this. We're all trying to learn how to coexist with COVID, and this mask wearing is, uh, is really critical. Um, let me just look at my notes here for a second. Oh, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci said yesterday, for those of you who, who like to hear and rely on Dr. Fauci, he said, we're not at the end of this. And um, so I know it's tiresome and I know it's aggravating, but stick with us here so that we can continue to have our economy open so that people can go to work. We know that uh, this, the end of this week is when the federal unemployment is ending for people. And um, so we really can't afford to uh, have even more people out of work than there are now. Hopefully Congress will take some action on that, but it, it won't be today, it won't be this weekend. Maybe they'll, they'll take action on it next week and extend the benefit. Uh, some talk that the benefit would be reduced, but extended. So uh, we, need to, we need to keep our economy open as much as we can and still uh, coexist with COVID. So that's, um, that's COVID for today. Got a couple of other things to talk about. Um, some of you may have seen in the news that yesterday Governor Parson was in town and uh, I, uh, I was at the meeting over at the police department along with our police chief, St. Louis County's chief, uh, Public Safety Director Judge Jimmy Edwards. A number of state representatives were there. Uh, Rasheen Aldridge, Wiley Price, Representative Aldridge, Representative Price, Representative Nick Shore, uh, Representative Greyer, uh, Representative, Shem Representative Shemed Dogan, uh, Representative Plockner, Representative Roberts, Senator Carla May was there as well, along with a number of people representing federal partnerships and County Executive Steve Ellman was there for a bit. The purpose of the meeting was to talk about the special session that the governor announced a week ago. That special session is going to consider um, <clears throat> several crime prevention and crime uh, initiatives. You all know that um, as of uh, end of the day yesterday, the city of St. Louis had had 138 homicides that uh, compares with 110 the year before on the same date. And of those 138 homicides, 30 of them were, let me rephrase that, of that 138 homicides, 11 of them were kids 
young people under the age of 18, uh, 11 homicides and an additional 21 uh, young people shot, so 30 young people in total shot. Just a very, very serious situation. There's a lot of stress in our community. There's a lot of um, pain in our community. There are a lot of people settling disputes uh, with guns, and uh, I think this very, very stressful time that we're in right now is we're seeing increases in shootings and homicides all across the U.S., not just in the city of St. Louis. St. Louis is what we're here to worry about. So the special session will have six items in it, including lifting the residency requirement. We hope for public safety, uh, law enforcement, firefighters, and EMS in the city of St. Louis so that we have a bigger pool of people to hire from because we are 130 officers short. Uh, we also, there's uh, new witness protection funding in this and um, there is also something that uh, would make it a felony if you transfer a gun to a minor, someone under 18. Um, so there, there are some good things in this special session. Hopefully this is not, uh, does not become a partisan issue um, because we really need to take action on these things. So the special session starts, uh, starts on Monday and um, I don't know how long it'll go. Could be a week, could be a couple weeks. Um, you know, all the details are not out yet about that. But that's what we were meeting on yesterday. And um, it is a, a matter of trying to make sure that we have the resources on the enforcement side, but that we also have resources on the prevention side. So that was, um, that was yesterday's meeting with the governor. Now, um, I mentioned this, next subject, I mentioned this also on Wednesday, a little more information is out there now. The City of St. Louis Municipal Court is now online, available for online. It's a virtual court alternative. It was really developed in response to COVID-19, uh, but it's of course something that we're gonna, we're gonna continue to do. Uh, it is uh, available to anybody who's got, whether it be a speeding ticket or uh, whatever kind of ticket that you have that you want to go to court on, you can sign sign on, get uh, an online session. There's a there's a form that's very easy to find on our website. It covers all traffic citations, any uh, metro fare citations, earnings tax cases, property maintenance, and uh, housing code violations, uh, all kinds of municipal violations that um, people. You can also pay your fine online. So I think that's, that's a good thing to, uh, to come out of this. Now, last subject before I take questions. I don't know, do you all know what today is? Opening day for the Cardinals. Uh, the 129th season home opener tonight at 7.15 against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, this is a 60 game um, season. It's, uh, you know, no one in the stands, you, you know that. Uh, this year's gonna be different. The season's gonna be like no other season, but St. Louis fans are like no other fans either. And so tonight, 7-15, let's play some baseball here in St. Louis. Go Cardinals. Hope you all enjoy it, watching from your uh, living room couch or uh, somewhere where you're socially distanced. So anyway, go cards. Questions? Okay, we have quite a few questions, Mayor, on COVID-19 okay. related issues. Christopher is watching um, and is asking about whether you were part of the phone call that Dr. Deborah Burks had at the White House this week that listed St. Louis as one of 11 American cities that should consider taking more aggressive measures and what your sort of response is to that proposal. So Christopher, I was not part of that phone call. In fact, I learned about it, I, I think on social media, on my phone or something. So no, not, no one in the city was part of that. Uh, we, were, we were somewhat surprised to be uh, listed there because there certainly are other areas of the country that, that are having much faster escalation. However, uh, that being said, as you know, if you're a regular viewer, 
uh, of our Live with Lidas, we watch these numbers every single day. We graph the numbers every day. Um, we've pulled back on some things, and uh, we are trying to get compliance, mass compliance, which we think is the biggest lever. If we could get 90% of the people wearing masks 90% of the time, the, the epidemiologists and the doctors believe we could see a downturn in this. So, no, I wasn't part of the call. I had no idea that, that uh, we would be uh, mentioned. Um, but nevertheless, we're watching the numbers. A couple of folks asking in general about compliance of the requirements that are required of businesses and the mask mandate, and who's responsible for monitoring compliance, how that's happening, and whether the city's going to consider fines. So the, um, you know, we're all responsible for for that. Businesses are responsible. They know that mask wearing is mandatory in the city of St. Louis and in St. Louis County. Uh, as you probably know, we have been visiting businesses. We get reports regularly of businesses that are not complying. Both their employees, I'm, I'm assuming this is an inside, but both their employees and their customers have to be wearing masks and the, unless the customers are, are eating, eating or drinking. And uh, even then they have to be uh, uh, sitting at a table and socially distanced from one another. So as you probably know, we issued uh, a number of letters early this week on Monday afternoon, I believe it was, for some large uh, businesses, primarily, um, I'll call them nightclubs, uh, that did not seem to be in compliance last weekend. So all of those businesses have been contacted. That letter has been delivered to them. Uh, at this time, we have not uh, closed any of those businesses, but we do have the ability to do that. That is not our point. Our point is to get people into compliance. So that is, that's where we stand on, on that, and we need uh, compliance from every individual, and we need compliance from every business. Kevin is watching, Mayor. <coughs> Kevin's question has to do with going back to school in August and what your thoughts are on returning in school. And we have a couple of similar questions about what role the city is playing in helping districts Mm -hmm. uh, developed their reopening guidance. So, Kevin, this I think is one of the toughest questions facing us, all of us, school districts and parents in particular. Uh, and that is, should kids go back to in-class in school? Should they do 100% virtual or should there be some uh, partially in-class, partial, partially virtual? And everybody knows that kids need to continue their education and we also know that we've got to worry about if kids don't go back to school well what will they be doing uh, will they be home on their computer doing their virtual classes what will parents be doing child care is an issue for all of this um, and so the school districts are uh, and, and you've seen this St. Louis Public Schools announced on Monday I think it was um, just, just earlier this week, they announced that they would have sort of a three option um, program. One would be in school, one would be virtual school only, and one would be a combination with, with smaller class sizes. Uh, you know, a, a couple of days in class and a few days out of class with regular check-ins via um, <clears throat> the internet, you know, with their teachers, with help via the internet. So this is one of those things. Here we are on the 24th of July. Um, on the 30th of July, which that's middle of next week, St. Louis Public Schools said that uh, the option would be available for parents to choose. Very, very tough situation. Uh, you're seeing differences throughout St. Louis County and differences throughout uh, the various school districts and I think that just goes to show how hard this is everybody wants to do what's the safest for kids for teachers for other employees who work in the schools and also get education to our kids and keep our kids safe not just from COVID but safe uh, in safe environments and in constructive environments so we're working with we have calls literally sometimes daily with uh, school districts. Uh, Dr. Will Pinckney is the Director of Children, Youth, and Families 
in my office and he and Dr. Eccles are on calls all the time with St. Louis Public School, with charter schools, with independent schools, with parochial schools, and everyone is struggling to come to the right answer. A couple of questions around um, another stay-at-home order, another quarantine. Do you think that that is the answer to bring the numbers back down? Maybe. Uh, but at this point, I don't think so. Uh, we are not, we're seeing increases in the hosp uh, hospitalization numbers, but not at the same rate as we're seeing cases. We're going to continue to watch all of that. Uh, another stay at home order would be a very severe um, step to take, and I think we would take some interim steps before we took that step. Um, just very, very difficult. One, the steps that you take, uh, you have to be sure that, you, that people will do it, that they'll go along with it. And, and the people of St. Louis, the first time when we had an eight week stay at home order and it was long and it was difficult, it did uh, help bring the numbers down. It did decimate many, many families and many, many, many workers. And so somehow we are trying to balance that. And that's why we say, just wear a mask, darn it. Um, because wear a, wear a mask, wear it properly, um, and just be around people who are wearing masks. So. Question from Rachel Mayer about whether you happen to know if the 22nd Judicial Circuit is considering at all, given the unemployment situation, reinstating the eviction ban at any point? You know, um, there has not been any decision made about that at this point in time, Rachel. What we're doing, and you, you know this if you've, if you've watched uh, with us before, is the city has $5.4 million that we have dedicated to rental assistance. And so putting the eviction order, uh, putting a stop to evictions, of course, means that landlords aren't getting rent. Uh, landlords have to make payments too. And so really what we've got to have is we've got to have Hopefully people are working as much as they can. We know some people have had their hours cut. We know some people have been laid off. And those are the people that we're gonna to try to help through our rental and mortgage assistance. And we've had a lot of applications already. And we are quite concerned what's going to happen uh, based on what happens in Congress. For, because for people that have been on both state and federal unemployment, um, most of, they have been making forty-eight, forty-seven, forty-eight thousand 48000 dollars a year. I mean, it hasn't been a year, but that has been enough to keep most people, um, at least to keep them going to where they could pay some of their rent, uh, along with other. We lose, I, I should say, because we are losing the federal unemployment piece then we're again quite concerned that there'll be even more people that will need rental assistance, uh, including mediation perhaps with landlords in order to keep them in their, uh, where they live in apartments, homes, uh, whatever their situation is. Very, very important to do that. A follow-up question, Mayor, to the uh, 5.4 million that the city's making available in rental and mortgage assistance. What has the turnout been like for that and the turn, you know what the turnaround time will be on getting the assistance? So as of a couple of days ago, there had been 2,500 applications. The turnaround time will be pretty quick uh, within a couple of weeks. And so, uh, you know, our, our folks in human services and affordable housing are working very diligently with other agencies as well to try to make sure that uh, we can get that money where it needs to go very quickly. We have a couple of non-COVID related questions. Okay. Um, can you provide an update on what the latest is with the Cure Violence model in the city of St. Louis? Yes. Uh, I feel like we talk about this uh, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, but it's important and because it's on the prevention side of, of fighting crime. You know, I think that uh, the end of May, June 1st, maybe it was, uh, almost two months ago, we uh, kicked off the first Cure Violence neighborhood, which was Wells, Goodfellow, Hamilton Heights. When I say we, 
He gave that contract to Employment Connections. They hired people, they trained people with Cure Violence, and they have already been intervening in some disputes. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, we selected the next two neighborhoods, and that is Dutchtown, where we also hired Employment Connections to hire and train up people with Cure Violence, and we hired the Urban League uh, in order to do the Walnut Park neighborhood. Those, both those, the second two neighborhoods, Dutchtown and Walnut Park, are in the process now of, of hiring, getting trained, that sort of thing. So we should have three neighborhoods running here with Cure Violence in the neighborhoods in, in, in the not too distant future. Okay, a few more COVID questions, Mayor, before we're out of time today. Um, ask, some asking for clarification on what the current restrictions are for group gatherings like for events or a barbecue or a graduation party um, and what the city's current restrictions say about those so what we're encouraging you is to have a small group as possible but if and there's actually not a group limit right now on having people over to your house or a barbecue that sort of thing but what there is a limit on is being socially distanced so if you're going to have folks over You've just got to stay six feet apart and you've still got to wear masks. Um, you know, that may be one of the first things that changes if we can't get this mask wearing and if we can't begin to drive these numbers down. But at this point in time, we're trying to, uh, to get everybody to use some good common sense. Keep your groups small, socially distance, wear a mask, wash your hands. Masks for city employees, Mayor, I think you may have addressed this, but we have a few folks asking if you can ask city employees, including police officers, to make sure that they are also wearing masks in public. Yes, city employees have to wear masks uh, just like everybody else um, and under the same conditions. If they're inside, they've got to wear a mask. If they're outside and within six feet of someone else, they've got to be wearing a mask. All right, we're almost out of time. We have a question from William about um, any possible guidance. We've talked about youth sports and how the city hasn't allowed them. Is there any consideration for intercollegiate or athletic sports at the college level, like SLU or at WashU, come fall and what that might look like later in the year? I don't know what it's gonna look like later in the year. I wish I did. I know you all wish you did too. Uh, you know, it's just very difficult to predict this, this COVID situation. Right now, the numbers are on the upswing. Uh, we don't like that. So I'm not going to make a prediction that that, that will uh, change or that we'll have collegiate uh, intramurals or, or sports. Uh, we'd like to, of course, but um, right now, I'm not going to predict on that. Final question of the day before we got to go. Adam's question is, is, is there actual evidence and data showing how masks, which you encourage us to wear, actually help to slow the spread of COVID-19? There is. A CDC, World Health Organization, every doctor in every hospital that I know. Because COVID is spread with aerosol droplets, breathing out of your nose, talking, if you're yelling even more, but particularly your nose. So breathing it out or breathing it in, either way. If you use a, the best is a three, three layer mask uh, or face covering, but even one layer is better than no layers. So there, I mean, all the professionals, all the physicians, all the hospitals uh, will tell you that wearing a mask will slow the spread considerably of COVID-19, so. Please wear a mask. All right, it's 2.30. Thanks all, appreciate you being with us today. Go Cards! <laughs>